well, we'll just sing a few hymns as others are gathering in. The prayer meeting isn't over yet, so others will be making their way over. And there's others gathering in the car park. We're glad to see you all, and we welcome you in our Saviour's name. Let's turn to the hymn 701. 701, Come to the Saviour, Make No Delay. We'll sing the first and the last verses of 701. Just remain seated, please, as we sing. Five hundred and eighty-seven, five eight seven. Shall we gather at the river, where bright angels' feet have trod? Uh, as you know, I do like a bit of fishing. I like to fish, and I had a fishing partner. He called him Bertie Cherry. Bertie Cherry. Some of you might have known him. He was a, a singer. He would have gone round the churches and he would have sung. He was a great man for gospel campaigning, and he sung at many, many gospel missions. He was an old stalwart, and I could call him that, but he was like a father figure to me, and uh, we went fishing all the time. I got to the stage where he couldn't drive, and I had to take him fishing, uh, but uh, we loved the fly fishing, and we always loved to get out fishing, but there was one day, he was just sitting at the back, just where about James is there in the Lisburn Church, and I picked this hymn. And uh, during the singing of the, the chorus, yes, we will gather at the river, he started fishing like this here, and he started flying, and I could not keep a straight face. And afterward, the next day, God convicted him, and he says, I can't believe I did that on you. I says, no, Bertie, it was all right. I had a good laugh at it. He says, no, no, he says, you're preaching the gospel, and so on and so on. Every time I think of this hymn, I always think of Bertie Cherry. Shall we gather at the river? I'm not going to say, well, suppose I could say, of those who said many years ago that there were individuals who uh, were converted to Christ and they gave up the drink and they went down to the river and they poured all the whiskey in the, in the river and then they sung, shall we gather at the river? But we're not going to do that. We're not thinking of that. But we gather at the river. That's the glorious river in heaven. Shall we gather at the river? We'll sing verses 1 and 5 and just remain seated. Others are still making their way into the house.
start our service proper, we'll turn to the hymn 201, please, just as you're finding the hymn, and the words should come up on the screen as well. Uh, but uh, we just want to give you all a very warm welcome to our gospel evening, and we're glad to see you. We warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name, whether you're a regular worshipper or you're a visitor with us. We want to warmly welcome you all in the Saviour's precious name. We're glad to see you. We would never want God's house to be a cold house for anyone. We wouldn't want you to come into this house. It could be you come in with a group and maybe someone didn't shake your hand at the door and maybe you feel already, well, I don't feel welcome here, I never got the handshake. And uh, maybe you have sat there and maybe no one has even spoken to you at the present time. And you could even leave. It would be an awful thing. Nobody ever said a word to you. Well, we want just to emphasize right now how glad we are to see you. And we want to thank you sincerely for joining with us. And we trust the Lord will richly bless you, both young and old alike. And also to those that are joining on the live stream, we do have a very large community out there, both home and abroad. Uh, you communicate regularly with us, and we want to thank you. Some get up very early in the morning. I find it hard to believe, uh, but you do. You've emailed me uh, from the United States. You get up very early in the morning just to tune in and to make these services your own. We do have another congregation congregation, by the way, over in Scotland, and uh, they don't have a pastor, about 25 or so gather, and they tune in to Cumber. I think what they do is they're a week behind, so they probably get this service next Sunday, I'm not sure, but they may be tuning in live, I don't know, uh, but even to those, uh, that congregation as well, and to many others at home, and uh, some we know are not well, and they have intimated to us that they will be listening. So we want to welcome you as well, and we trust the Lord will bless you and your family. 201 then, and we'll stand as we sing after the key. Let's all stand. That's good singing. Let's just unite our hearts together in prayer. I actually feel I'm losing my voice at the minute. It doesn't maybe sound like that, but it feels like it. 
I've been taking honey and I've been eating a lot of sweets. I like that bit. And uh, drinking a little bit of water. <laughs> so uh, hopefully I'll be able to finish the service. Loving Father, we come to thee in our Saviour's name. And we thank thee, our Father and God, that none need perish, none need perish. For Christ has suffered, bled and died. And we thank thee, that's the gospel of thy grace. It does not belong to a church or a congregation or a denomination. It does not belong to an institution or an organization. But this is the word of thy grace. This is the word to build us up. This is thy word, O God, ordained to save them that believe. And this is the power of God unto salvation. None need perish. What a message we have tonight. Lord, it's not that we're, Lord, hoping against hope. It's not that we're punching the air. It's not that we're grasping at straws. It's not that we're offering, Lord, some little glimmer of hope to the sinner. We can say on the authority of the finished work of Christ and the shed blood of the Lamb, the bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead, his ascension into heaven and his own work on the cross. None need perish. None need perish. All may come, for Christ has died. And we pray, O God, that sinners will repent and believe that across our province, in this house, even through the live stream, that even at home or in hospital or in nursing or residential care, or even some, Lord, who are uh, tied up, Lord, with works of necessity and mercy, that get an opportunity to hear the word. And we pray for those who are saved, that they may rejoice in the gospel of God's love in Christ, that sent the darling of his bosom into this world, and then and we may rejoice that Christ was willingly, Lord, put to death by the hands of cruel and wicked men. But by the predominant counsel of God, he was crucified upon that old Roman gibbet. We bless thee, Father, that he was in control of all things and he ordered all things. And so that the scriptures might be fulfilled, he called things into being. He was in control at Calvary. He was directing the affairs, even the crucifixion, even what they would say about him, even even the fact that he would be offered the vinegar, that they would part his garments among them and gamble for them at the foot of the cross. Even the very cries and the timings of it were all planned and Christ was in full control of his senses. He was in full control of events. And we thank thee, O God, that he came to die. He came to give his life a ransom price for sin. No man took his life from him, but he laid it down of his own volition. And Christ suffered and bled and died and rose again. And he is alive forevermore. And we have the glorious gospel of thy salvation in Christ. And we pray that as that glorious message goes forth this evening, that sinners will be brought under conviction for their sin. We pray, O oh God, for a definite move of the Spirit. We pray for a work of God and grace. We ask, Lord, you will trouble hearts from the youngest child to the oldest individual. Lord, we pray that thou wouldst bring conviction for sin. Trouble hearts tonight, Lord. Show sinners their lost estate, Lord. We pray that the Holy Ghost, whose task on earth is to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come, that the Holy Ghost would work in the heart of the sinner, bring that healthy fear of God. We pray, Lord, you will take sleep from their eyes and we're not being cruel. Lord, we realize it's needful if they're not going to repent and believe. Grant that they'll take sleep from their eyes even take their appetite away for food and grant Lord they'll not even have a desire to do anything else even go to work Lord because they're not saved and they could perish at any time and we pray oh God you will trouble them and you will awaken them uh, to their desperate need. May they get a glimpse into the very pit of hell tonight. And may they turn and believe this very hour. And trust in thy grace and saving power. We pray that they may come to the fountain filled with blood. And wash and be clean. We pray that they will come to Christ Lord. The one who suffered as their substitute. The one who offered to thee our Father God. A perfect sacrifice to save lost souls. To satisfy divine justice to turn away eternal wrath upon our soul, to save us from perishing in hell. Christ came into the world and loved to, to souls and died upon the cross. And we pray for the rescuing and ransoming of precious, never-dying souls tonight. We pray, Lord, across our land that there will be that move of God. And we pray, O oh God, you will bless those who have come to faith in recent weeks and months, those who have come back to first love again. And we praise thee for that. We thank thee for the work of 
grace in, in God. And we ask, Lord, you will disciple these individuals. You'll lead them on with thyself. And we pray you'll employ them and you'll use them in the harvest fields. We pray, Lord, that they will seek to testify and witness to others and others in their family and among their school friends and work colleagues, Lord, and even in their neighborhood, Lord, and old companions in sin will see the glorious and wonderful change in their lives and they will know that there is a God in heaven and that Christ is the answer to every need. So hear our prayer, not only here in Cumber, but Lord, we pray you'll bless both inside and outside our own denomination. Many who are faithful to the blood and to the book, grant you'll lay liberally to the charge of every ambassador of the cross and we pray that Christ will be preeminent in worship in song, in prayer, in praise, that in everything that's said and done and in the preaching of the gospel, that Christ will be central and he will be lifted up. And as he's lifted up, he has promised, I will draw all men unto myself. So hear our prayer tonight. Come, blessed Holy Ghost, we beseech thee. Exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work and bring sinners to repentance and faith. And we will be very careful to give all the praise, the honor and the glory to thee, our our great God and we're not unmindful of many who mourn and those who have suffered loss in our family church here we commend them to thee remember the McCartney remember the McLennan family circles remember the Furley family many others oh God in recent years and months who have suffered bereavement remember the Barnes family circle we commend them to God and we ask that you would draw near and undertake for all and every need they have Remember, Lord, the Nichols family. We commend uh, Lord Stuart and his wife and the family to the Lord as well. And we pray for the comfort of thy grace. And we pray, Lord, that we will recognize there go I but for the grace of God. And we pray, Lord, that each one of us will think about, Lord, the time whenever we will leave this scene of time, when death will call or the Lord will return. And may we be ready to meet the Lord. Prepare to meet thy God. We humbly ask these things now, giving all the praise and the honour to our blessed Lord Jesus Christ and the people of God said, Amen. 241, we're going to stand together as we sing. Just before we stand, we'll have the ladies uh, start on the verse 1, so ladies, keep that in mind. We'll have you serenade all, uh, us all on the verse 1, and then we'll join with you on the chorus, and then, gentlemen, we'll have you on verse 2. And everybody on the chorus. Verse 3 is a cappella. So we'll leave the music out. We'll have the note to start us off. And then we'll see just exactly how and who is singing. So ver verse 1, ladies. Verse 2, gentlemen. And then everyone a cappella on the verse 3. <laughs>
be seated. That was excellent singing. We have to commend you and praise you on that, and uh, we want you to keep that up. We're turning to the book of James for our Bible reading. It's James chapter 4, and we're going to break in at the chapter at verse 7. James chapter 4. The book of James was sadly rejected as part of the canon of Holy Scripture by maybe one, I don't know if there were more, of our reformers, uh, some who had come out of the Church of Rome and the doctrine of justification by works. They couldn't just reconcile the book of James to justification by faith. And some of them, some of them, I know one in particular, rejected the book of James as part of the canon of Holy Scripture. Uh, James no doubt believed and doctrinally stood where everyone stands who's a true born-again Christian, justification by faith alone. Uh, But when we say faith alone, it doesn't mean that after someone professes there's no life of good works. Good works don't save us, but they're an indication that we're converted The Bible speaks about those things which accompany salvation. And if someone professes to be a Christian and they're not doing this thing, that thing and the other, and there seems to be no real change in their lives, then what James is really saying, that person's faith is dead. It's really dead. In fact, works show that a person is actually saved. They don't save. And with respect to our reformers, They totally misunderstood the book of James. He's dealing with events after you're saved. And he says that by works a man is justified. It simply means that after a person is saved, they will give evidence in their life that there is a change and that there has been a conversion to Christ. And their life will show that and their life will prove that. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And if you take the literal Greek It goes like this. All things are passing away. All things are becoming new. So the book of James is part of the canon of Holy Scripture. We're breaking in at the chapter. It's a very practical epistle at verse 7. And we want to read together and hear the word of God. James chapter 4 and verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren, He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law, that is the law, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time, then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Amen. We'll end our reading there at the verse 17. We know the Lord does and always will bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. We're going to ask our clerk of session, Mr. Alistair, please, if he'll come forward. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Good evening to you all. Good to see you again. We do welcome you warmly. Uh, And it's quite a warm welcome tonight, I feel, anyway, uh, in this house. Uh, But we're glad to see you all 
in the house of God. We do pray God's blessing upon us uh, even throughout this service. Uh, do remember, young adults, that after this meeting, you have a choir practice, a uh, quick choir practice before you head over to the rally, uh, at young adults rally in Newton Ards. And of course, that choir practice is to prepare for participating at our youth mission, which is coming up in the month of June. Tuesday at 8 o'clock, our prayer meeting, and as we've been mentioning, it is a deputation meeting. My brother, Mr. Glenn Hamilton, uh, who with his family will be heading out to Kenya in the not too distant future, uh, is doing a round of our churches and deputation uh, to build up the funds that are needed to uh, keep him there on the mission field. So do remember that meeting, please. Uh, Friday at 8 p.m., the Youth Fellowship, and at 10 p.m., the men's prayer meeting. Uh, then remember, this is for you younger folks and for those involved in working with them, uh, there is the Breakfast Bible Club at 10 a.m. on Saturday, and no doubt the arrangements have been sorted out for that, but do remember that. Uh, next Lord's Day, our services at the normal time, quarter past 10, the Sunday School and Bible Class, at half past 11, our morning service with the Reverend Martin, uh, 3.30 in the afternoon, again, an announcement for the young adults. Uh, there is uh, that afternoon prayer meeting for the young adults, uh, directed really in praying for uh, the youth, upcoming youth mission, so keep that in mind. At 7 p.m., uh, of course, our own minister will be starting uh, the mission down in Achnatloi, uh, but the Reverend Paul Hanna will be with us to minister in the gospel next Lord's Day evening. Can I mention as well our next family and friends night uh, coming up just two weeks from tonight, Sunday the 24th, 28th of April. Uh, Mr. John Kennedy will be along to testify uh, and uh, our sister Cherith Kenny will be ministering in song, God willing. Thank you. Let's turn to the hymn 230, just before we come to the preaching of the Word of God. The mission uh, has started over in Ballygown Congregation, half past three this afternoon. Uh, I've managed to get over to that first meeting. It's a great turnout, and God's servant preached very, very ably the gospel. And he took it from a very unusual text, and if you get an opportunity to listen to that message, you should. In Ecclesiastes 12, uh, it was a very, very interesting message, and very apt and uh, there are things there that I didn't even recognize or notice myself, but well brought out in the gospel, and uh, certainly touched my heart. It got me in mission mode, and uh, I just wanted to head down to Aklacloy start up, and start the mission right away, and I was certainly blessed. And we trust the Lord will bless the two weeks of gospel campaigning in uh, Ballygown. If the Lord lays it on your heart this incoming week, I'd ask you please to remember me as your pastor as I travel to Aklacloy next Sunday evening, commencing in the church, and then we are going the following week into the scout hall, uh, I don't know where it is, but I take it's in the middle of the town somewhere. I'll see it on Tuesday, for I hope to go down there to do a video and also to do some outreach in connection with the meetings commencing next Lord's Day. So please pray. There are other missions that we'll be involved in through the year. We'll let you know about those missions as they arrive and as they're coming close. But remember too, Ballygown, remember the mission in Ocklacloy. There's another tent mission coming up in Anna Hill, connection with our Hillsborough and our Balna Hinch congregation. And uh, we trust the Lord will give them favourable weather when they start at the beginning of May. I understand as well another mission commencing in our Martyrs congregation and there are other gospel missions that have just finished. We pray that God will bless the preaching of the word of God and bring many souls to Christ as Saviour. 230. I never start off with this hymn by the way and I'm sure you would understand why. Be in time. Now, if you were a wee bit late tonight and we were singing this hymn would you not feel embarrassed? We were singing, be in time, be in time. I'll tell you why I don't sing it first, because I actually got caught. It was a second hymn, by the way, so that's how late we were. We got to an orange hall where there was a mission on, and uh, my wife knows it was up in, what do you call that place, June, up in Portrush? 
That's it, Artie Clave. That's exactly where it is in the orange hall there. And just as we were about to go in, there was about maybe four or five of us. We put the hand on the door and we opened the door and all you heard was the chorus, be in time, be in time. And this lady just slammed the door and she says, we're not going in there. And not at that moment. So we waited till they finished. But if anybody comes in late now, tough. <laughs> we have to sing this at some stage. Uh, but it's a tremendous hymn. We don't have the name of the author, but it's a tremendous hymn. Life at best is very brief, like the falling of a leaf, like the binding of a sheaf, be in time. Let's stand after the first note and be ready for the introductory key. looking at the words and you weren't looking at me uh, but if you were looking at me I was taking deep breaths on all those lines I was really taking deep breaths and I'll tell you exactly why uh, because I don't want to preach from my throat tonight I want to preach from what is known as the diaphragm now, that's not a part of a cure by the way that's part of the body and if you preach from the diaphragm you'll never hurt the throat you'll never have a sore throat you could preach through mission after mission after mission, meeting after meeting. And like me, you could talk right through to your sleep to the next morning and you'll not lose your voice. Uh, but So that's what I was doing as I was singing. I was getting myself ready to preach from what they call here, in here. And if I preach from in here, then it'll not affect the throat. So hopefully I'll be able to do those exercises. And if you hear me breathing heavily through the message, you know I'm trying just to get the voice from the diaphragm instead of the back of the throat. Verse 14 of James chapter 4. And we read those words, For what is your life? For what is your life? What is your life? What's life all about? Why are you here? James gives a little answer, just in the context. But he wasn't giving a theological uh, answer to a question 
He was really just in context saying uh, to these individuals, your life is short, be careful how you live your life, what you do in life, for life's like a vapour, it appears for a little season, then vanishes away, it's gone, it's over. Life is so precious, uh, don't waste it. And don't say, I'll do this and do that. Say, if God will, because what is your life? It's in his hand, and it's nothing without him. But that's the context, but we could really lift the question out of context, and we're going to do that tonight, and we're going to take this question as we did on Tuesday night. We took a little verse, and we want to take it on a journey. I want to take it to the world and to mankind and ask them the question, what is life and what's your life? And then I want to take it to the Bible, and we get the answer tonight of what this question's asking. I trust we'll be able to leave tonight knowing the answer, what is life? your life. Father in heaven, with the word of God open before us, with the book of God in our hand, with the word in our hearing, we pray now for the operation of the Holy Ghost. We pray for the descent of the Spirit, just as he did on Pentecost. So blessed Holy Dove, descend upon us now. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Come, blessed third person of the Godhead, the promise of the Father, the Comforter. We pray you'll come and visit this house this evening. Come and exalt Christ. Reveal the things of God to us. Teach us from thy word. Take away every distraction, every wandering thought. Bring a solemnity to the gathering. We know it's warm in the building, but we pray, Lord, that we will not be Lord, weary or tired, we pray the mind will not wander. We pray the eyes will not droop. We pray, O oh God, there'll be the lengthening because the Spirit of God is here, demanding and commanding attention. So give the hearing ear and the listening and the understanding mind, the receptive heart. And to this end, Almighty God, I now pray for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I stand in human weakness. Thou knowest my heart. I stand, Lord, in human insufficiency. I stand in my inability. I'm cast upon thee publicly. And I ask now, Father, publicly before this congregation, for I stand before God and these people as a candidate for the infilling of the Spirit of the living God. I pray for that anointing. I ask for that endowment of power from on high. I pray for the infilling with wisdom and with power for the preaching of Christ, of the blessed Spirit of the living God. And Father, in answer now to prayer, save the lost. But we ask it in the Savior's precious and worthy name. And the people of God said, Amen. You know, it is true that from the beginning of time, Uh, mankind or man and we're using the generic term here by the way we mean male and female oft times in the bible the term man is used we know that it does mean male and there's times it does mean male and female and whenever God created man in the beginning he literally meant male and female it goes on to say that male and female created he him but man from the beginning of time has attempted to answer the perplexing question what is life all about His search has basically taken him to the four corners of this earth. It has taken him to the depths of the deep blue sea and even to the heights of God's created heaven. Through the literal uh, millennia and centuries of time, man has been searching for the meaning of life. He has been plagued in his conscience because he can never find the answer outside of God and outside of the, the Bible. But he has been plagued with such questions as, where did I come from? And he sought to answer that with some strange and weird and far-fetched views. Why am I here? And he seems to answer that in views that really bring us despair. Where am I going? And the answer to that, most cannot really say. Some hope, some assume, some don't really care. And those who are searching... They say, well, nowhere. What a view of life that is. Where am I going? Why am I here? Where did I come from? What is life all about? What is 
your life. You know, despite his ageless search, man is just as uncertain and even more confused as ever as to the origin of life and the reason why we are here. The meaning of life remains a mystery to mankind, an unresolved puzzle, a perplexing question that plagues his soul, that pricks his conscience every day of his existence on this earth. There are individuals who have given their lives to the search of happiness, the pursuit of contentment, and they have never found it outside of God and Christ and the finished work of the cross. Throughout history, man searched for meaning and purpose in life. He has come up with some very strange and erroneous views or answers alongside man's opinion and man's search and findings is what the Bible says about the origin of life, about the beginning of life on earth, where we came from, why we are here, and where we are going. The Bible has the answer. And James, I know, asks a question in context, but that really could be asked of the entire created earth. What is your life? Young person, older person, boy or girl, what is your life all about? Why are you actually here? Tonight, I want to consider with you those two opposing views. The view of the world or men, and the view of the Bible and the Scripture. And I want to ask the question of both, what is your life? Firstly, let me consider what the world or men says about life. You see, there are some who say life is a vexation. That's exactly what they say. Life is a vexation. It seems to echo the actual words of the book of Job, chapter 14, 1 and 2, when Job said, man that is born of a woman is of few days, listen to it, and full of trouble. His days are few. You would imagine he would have a day of rest and peace in this world, but he doesn't. Man that is born of a woman is of few days. Well, you wouldn't disagree with that. But it goes on to say, and he's full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower, and he's cut down, and he fleeth as a shadow, and he continueth not, and the days are full of trouble. It seems that the world, if you talk to individuals, they say life is nothing but vexation. Life for the majority of individuals is filled with problems. And if you didn't believe that, I would ask you now, where on earth do you live? Who do you move with? Who do you chum around with? I could bring you tonight to Cumber, only a few hundred yards from this church, and there are individuals will tell you about their life. It's full of vexation. They say they wake up in the morning until they, they lay their head on the pillow at night, and life is hard. It's really hard. Life is tough. Life is difficult. Life is frustrating. Life is grievous and life is vexing and you just don't know the problems that I have in life. And therefore, when they consider that, they conclude that life begins as a child with a cry and it ends, if you're fortunate, in old age with a groan. That's what life is. For life, for many, is full of suffering. It's full of sorrow. And I'm sure you and I have met a lot of people like that. Even some of God's people. And some folks I visit on your behalf in the congregation here who were stalwarts and were here longer than I am. As a church family on your behalf as their pastor, I go to see them. I sit with them. And some of them haven't seen a pain-free day in decades. Some of them had horrendous things happen in their lives. They've got pain and heartache and sorrow and trouble. Some of those folks would not say life is a vexation. But those who are out of Christ, those who do not know the Lord, those who have not life and life more abundant in Christ, they will say life is a vexation. But friends, it cannot be anything other for the ungodly sinner living in an ungodly world. Because this life is full of trouble. But that's not the way God created things in the beginning. Oh no. God created everything in the beginning. 
And in Genesis 1 verse 31, he looked at his creation. And here's what God said. And it says, and God saw that everything he had made was, listen to it, very good. Life was never created to be a vexation. Life was never created to be full of trouble. Life was never created by God to be full of sorrow and suffering and pain and misery and anguish and woe. It wasn't. Life was never created for sickness and disease. Life was never created for hospitals and jails. Life was never created for correctional centers. Life was never created for rehabilitation of offenders. No, it wasn't. Life was never created for psychiatric units. I want to tell you when God created this entire earth and universe, the Bible says that God looked and God saw. He is omniscient. He knows all things. He sees all things. And when he saw the work of his hands, here's what he says. And he saw that it was not just good, but he saw that it was very good, the best, in the sense that he could produce for his purpose and for life on earth. But man sinned against God in the garden. And as a consequence of that sin, the Bible says he brought heartache and misery and pain. And he brought vexation to life. And in a measure when the ungodly sinner, when the man or woman outside of Christ says that life is a vexation, they're really echoing the sentiments of the fall in Adam. They're really telling us that the Bible is actually true. That God created everything in the beginning and it was very good. But man sinned and after Adam sinned, God said this unto Adam. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed be the ground for thy sake. And sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles. Listen, I'm not even a gardener. I'm not even a gardener. And I said to my wife the other day, I'm away out to cut the weeds. There's no grass. It just seems they're gone, but the weeds are thriving. You know, if there was an industry for weeds, you wouldn't care to hoots farmers about the weather. The weeds are flourishing. Dandelions, never seen as many. In Black Rock Hollow and Grove and Avenue in my life, they're everywhere, and especially my garden. And I thought I'd cut them. And the moment the sun shone, they rose again. And there they were, standing upright, as if they were mocking and laughing. Says, you can't get rid of me. You could buy the best of screen soil. Did you know that? And they would guarantee you this is weed-free. It's been treated, screened. And all of a sudden, the weeds grow. You know why? God put them in the soil. They're there. Man can't take them out. And by the sweat of man's brow, he'll bring forth of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat thy bread till thou return unto the ground. Dust thou art, unto dust shalt thou return. You know, the experience of all mankind is summed up in Job in 5 and 7. Yet man that is, is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. How true that is. And you know, my friend, listen to me. Life has no meaning. Life has no purpose outside of Christ. Christ is the life. He has come to give us life. He has come to deal with that which is the cause of all misery and all vexation in life. And I want to tell you something. Until your sin is dealt with, you'll never find happiness. You can search to the highest heaven, the four corners of this earth, and delve into the deepest blue sea that you can ever find. And you will never find happiness or joy or contentment in life. Among the Hollywood superstars, if you ever hear, read some of their writings and some of their sayings, if you ever go and follow them in any measure, you will find those who commentate upon them, especially they say this, they are the most miserable people on earth. And they don't mean they're tight. They're not. Most of them give, and we commend them, most of them give their fortune away to charity and to worthy charities at that. And we might be envious of their riches, but they give a vast amount of their riches away. They give it away to charities and to needy causes. But I want to tell you something, all their money all their possessions, all their belongings. And don't think for one moment that if you had all that, you'd be happy. A relation of mine told me, I quote, that I would only be happy if I win the lottery. Now, they haven't won it yet, but they did. And I told you before, they said this to me. I don't know where they got the figure from, but they said this to me. I see when I win the lottery, that's what they said to me. I'm going to give you a hundred thousand pound. You know what I said? You're not. I'm not taking it. 
But did I regret that? No, I didn't. And I'm hoping they don't win it, because I know them. They will offer it. But I want to tell you, friends, you have my word on it before God. I'll not be taking it. Money will never buy me peace. Money will never give me happiness and contentment. I'll tell you who does and has Christ. He has dealt with my sin at the cross. He has died as my substitute. He has paid the price. He has suffered the punishment, the eternal penalty. I have something in my heart that money could not give me. Nothing in this world could bring such happiness. I have a peace that no, no, nothing in this world could ever disturb. And I want to tell you, life without Christ is a vexation. Now, I could turn the coin over. I could talk to the world tonight. And there are some who will say, well, I don't say that. Preacher, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're way off the mark. Life for me is not a vexation. Life for me is a vacation. Life for me is a vacation. It's just one big party. And we've met people like that and they've told me, huh, I'll not be going to church. Life is too short. I have too much to do. There are nightclubs. There are things that I need to do. There are drinks that I need to drink. There are drugs that I need to take. And there are company that I need to keep. And there's things on my bucket list that I want to tell you. One of them's not going to church. None of them, one of them's not getting religious. One of them's not coming as you do gooders are and going to church and reading your Bible. I want to tell you, life is a vacation. Life is so short, you've got to enjoy the moment. You've got to make the most of it. And I want to tell you, there are individuals, and that's what they say. Life must be lived to the full. Life must be enjoyed, but not with God. Life must be taken literally by the locks of opportunity and grasp and every moment lived so that whenever I die, you can have a party at my death and you can say this, this man lived life to the full. He enjoyed his drink. He enjoyed his socializing. He enjoyed his parties. This man did this in life and that in life. And I want to tell you, he spent all his money and he didn't care. And he didn't care about anyone or anything. And he lived for himself. And he just thought to himself, well, I'll just live life as I please. I'll do what I want. No one will judge me. No one will censure me. No one will ever tell me what to do. And you do good or stay away from me. Don't bother me. Life's a vacation. And I'm enjoying life. But they're not really. Because at the end it will bite like the adder. It will sting as a bee. And bring the soul down into the depths of despair. The rich farmer was like that in Luke 12. When the Bible says that he said to his soul. Soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years. He said many years. That's what he said. Many years. So, and then he said, because you have many years, what are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you what he says. I'll take my ease. I'll eat, drink, and be merry. Life is a vacation. That's what it is. It's not a vexation to me. I have everything life can give me. And life hasn't thrown too much my way. I seem to be okay. I fear for an individual. There's more hope for a man or a woman or a young person who says life is a vexation. To find Christ and one who says life is a vacation. It's one big party. And even those who mock and some who say, well, it'll only be a big party here, but it'll be a big party in hell. And here's what they say. And they've said it to me more times than enough. Individuals. And they've mocked. And they says, listen, you'll be in your little holy huddle in heaven. You'll be on your little uh, cloud playing your harp. What view of heaven is that? It's not the biblical heaven. I'd be in hell, I'd be chief stoker, you know, stoking up the fire. And I tell you, we'll have dark, a bit of darkness there and the light of that fire and we'll just party for eternity and there'll be nobody there to preach at us. There'll be no Bible to throw at us. There'll be nobody there uh, even to convict us or say a word to us. There'll be not my mother or my grandmother or my brother or my sister. They'll be in heaven if that's where they're going and they'll be in their little holy huddle and they'll not even think of me but life will only be a party on earth but it'll be one big party in heaven. What a lie that is. Did you know, friends, listen to me, look at me. In hell, there is the blackness of darkness forever. Not a single man or woman, boy or girl, who ever enters into hell will ever come into contact with another human being, nor devil, nor demon. Not one. Isolated in the blackness of darkness and torments. No laughter, no joy, no peace, no contentment. All you had was the spark of your light in this world. All you had was your little day 
of sin. And now the night of eternal judgment has come. You see, we're living in a pleasure-crazed world, aren't we? Many are seeking pleasure at the end of a bottle. Many are seeking pleasure at the end of the point of a needle. Many are seeking pleasure in lust of the flesh and so on, gratifying their fleshly desires and whatever they can find to do and how immoral society has become. And they say, life for me is a vacation. But I want to tell you there's only real, lasting happiness. They have to go back to their bottle, don't they? They have to go back to their drugs. They have to go back to their lust. Never satisfies. It's never enough. They need more and more and more until they can get nothing else. I want to tell you there's only life and happiness to be found in Christ. You know, there are others who say life is not only a vexation or a vacation, but there are some who say life is a void. What they mean by that is just a big nothing. There's a man who was commentating recently or putting up posts on Twitter and he was discussing his life. It was just a mess, just despair. I didn't really get time to download it or even write it all out, but I took some notes of it. It goes like this. You know, life for me has no rhyme nor reason. No rhyme, no reason. There's no rhythm to my life. There's no harmony with the way I'm living. You know what he says? He says, in my life, happiness is unattainable. That's what he said. You know what else he said? Everything is shallow and hollow. And he says, I am depressive and suicidal. There's nothing. For life is empty. And life is a void. My friends, listen to me. There are many young people like that tonight, even in this town of Cumber. And that's how sin has brought them to conclude that life is void. And the only way out, the devil tells them, is suicide. The killing of oneself. Friends, listen to me. I'm telling you tonight in the authority of God's word, life has purpose. It has meaning, it has value, it's precious. And God puts great value in your life and mine. And never listen to the lie of the devil, no matter how you're feeling tonight. Life is precious. Life is valuable. And God puts a tremendous price on the life of a human being. And I want to tell you, for some individuals, life is a big nothing. That's what they say. You just live as a brute beast and you die as the beast and that's it. There's nothing after. And there's nothing on this earth. And this earth is getting worse and worse and worse. And we'd all be better if we weren't here. Life is futile, they tell us. Life is unfulfilling. And that's true without God and without Christ. No one has the answer to life. Life is a boring, depressive experience. But what a terrible view of life that is. What an awful view of life that really is. You know, Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon was a saved man. Solomon was, we would term in New Testament theology, a born-again Christian. He was a believer in God, and he, I believe he believed in Christ, the, the Messiah who would come. I believe Solomon is in heaven. But did you know that when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, that Solomon wasn't walking with God? Did you know that? That Solomon was not in touch with the Lord? That Solomon was far from God, even though he was the wisest man on earth, humanly speaking, apart from our Lord? And the Bible says that Solomon, because he got away from the Lord, he began a search for happiness. And that's why he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Did you know that? It's Solomon's vain search for happiness in this world without God. And at the end of his life, and at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, listen, after my search for years and decades, I conclude that man's duty is to fear God, to keep his commandments, for this is the, the whole duty of man. And if he'd only begun there where he stopped, he would have saved himself an awful lot of misery and pain. Did you know in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon tried everything in this world? Did you know that? You should read the book of Ecclesiastes and you should highlight these with a marker, a red pen or a highlighter. You will find that he, he, he goes and he talks about, I commended mirth. He searched and he tried to find happiness in laughter. 
Do you know I meet people today? I, I like jokes. I, I love to joke about. I know that. Not so much in the pulpit, but at home. Mess about, my boys call it. They're the same. June has a, a nightmare with our three boys when they're in the house. Total nightmare. We had a games night the other night, and there was nothing but messing about. Total messing about. But I enjoyed it. But let me tell you something. There are people, and they just tell jokes. And they just live life in humour. And they try to find happiness in laughter. There's people who have joke books. There are people who watch comedy shows. The people who, when you meet them, they'll tell you a new joke, they'll tell you an old joke, and they'll tell you a thousand more jokes, and you'll laugh with them, and you'll laugh with them. They like to socialise, and when they get to socialise, they love to laugh. You look at people, well, I don't want to ask you to do it, but if you were to see people in public houses and other places tonight, you will find they're laughing, they throw their heads back, and they laugh, and they think they're finding happiness in laughter. Well, that's exactly what Solomon said. I commended mirth. I searched after laughter, funny stories, jokes. To find happiness, I couldn't find it. He actually said liquor. He spoke about wine. I'm just alliterating these for you. Laughter. And then he sought after liquor. He started to take the wine. He started to drink. And he got drunk. And he found no lasting happiness in laughter. No lasting happiness in liquor. And then he tried lust. Did you know that he had over 700 wives? And hundreds more concubines? And he says, I tried laughter, and I tried liquor, and I tried lust, and I didn't find happiness. And then he says, I, f I tried lucre, that means riches or money. And Solomon was the richest man on earth. And he says, it brought me nothing but misery. Most rich people lie at wake at night wondering, will the bank go down? Will the stocks and shares go down tomorrow? I tell you, don't seek after riches or greatness like that. But be content with what you have in life and what God has given you. And he has given you riches, you rejoice in it. And ask him to ask you how you should use that look at riches. He tried luxury. He had everything. In fact, the Queen of Sheba came and she looked at all that surrounded Solomon. And she said these words, The half has not been told me. The half has not even been mentioned. What you have here. I've never seen finery and luxury, gold and ivory and your servants, the way they're dressed and that your table, the way it's spread. And he says, I tried laughter. I tried liquor. I tried lust. I tried lucre, money. I tried luxury. And then he tried learning. He was the wisest man. And he set himself to learn and to find out things by, by research. And he still found no joy. And then he concluded... You see, what he had done was this. He had tried laughter, liquor, lust, lucre, luxury and learning. But he never, he, he missed out the Lord. And if he had begun there and stayed there, he would not have caused himself to have such misery. Although we do have the inspired record here in the book of Ecclesiastes, his vain search. And at the end of it all, did not that what he says? He says, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. It's all vain. But in conclusion, I want to take the question, what is your life, to the Bible. I want to ask God, the author of life, what he says about life tonight. And we keep with the alliteration using the letter V. Life is a voyage. That's exactly what the Bible says life is. Life has a starting point and an end point. Life has a destination. And it doesn't necessarily end here on earth in death. Life goes on, friend. Your body may be laid into Mother Earth, but your soul will never die. That soul lives on because it has immortality. Heaven or hell, saved or lost, glory or despair. Where will you spend eternity? See, life is a voyage. That's exactly what the Bible teaches from the moment you were born and I was born uh, to the moment we die, we're on a journey and we're on a road and we're on a way and we're on a pathway, we're on a highway. We have an eternal destination. Every person in this world, they're born into this world. God gives them life and life is a voyage. 
The Lord Jesus Christ said these words, echoing exactly what I said to you. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And there's a path that mankind is on. And it's either the broad road that leads to hell and destruction. And Jesus said, enter in at the straight gate, for narrow is the way or the road that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Either one of us, each one of us rather, are on a journey. We're on a voyage. We're either on the broad road that leads to destruction or on the narrow way. On which road are you traveling? I was trying to find that poem or that song. I remember years ago in Lurgan Freeze, there was a young girl came and she was part of the Sunday school and she sung that song. To this day, I've never forgotten it, but I couldn't find it on the internet. Maybe some of you know what it is. On which road are you traveling, the broad or narrow way? And I wanted to read it out to you. It really resonated with me and spoke to me all those years ago, 1989 or so. 1990, and it always stayed with me. And she sung it so beautifully, a trained voice, a little girl from the Sunday school. On which road are you traveling? The broad or the narrow way? See, life is a voyage. You have an end a destination, heaven or hell. You see, my friend, preparation must be made in that journey. And only in time can you make that preparation for you need to come to Christ who has suffered, bled and died as the substitute for sinners and has been raised from the dead and is alive forevermore. The Bible says that life is a voyage. Very quickly, the Bible says life is valuable. Life is valuable. There are some people who don't treat their life with much value. They self-harm. They cut themselves. It seems they mutilate their body. It seems that they abuse their body and they put things into it God never intended. And I want to tell you, life is valuable. It's very precious. Did you know that God created you in his image? Now, I know that that image is spoiled because of sin, but God created you different. He didn't create you like he created a dog or a cat or a pig or a cow. He didn't. He didn't create you as he would create a lion or a giraffe. God didn't create you as he would create an eagle or even a dolphin with high intelligence. Not one of those created beings was ever created like you because you were created for fellowship with your maker and the animal kingdom wasn't. That's the difference. Listen, friends, and I hope it doesn't offend you. Dogs and cats do not go to heaven. And I know you love your animals. I know you do. But they don't go to heaven, friends. But I'll tell you this. It's human life that is more important than even animal life. God puts a value on human life. And here's what God said of those that take human life. He said after Noah came out of the ark, he says, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he him. Did not the Lord command us, thou shalt not kill? The word there is thou shalt not murder. That allows for a just war, by the way. And for the fighting of Hamas, thou shalt not murder. Did you know that the Lord says this? Listen to this. Here's the Lord. And here's what he says in the book of Ezekiel. And I love this. He says, as I live, as I am life, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked might turn from his way and enjoy life, live. That's what the Lord says. Turn ye. Turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die when I want you to live? When I have created you for life with a capital L. I know it's marred in the fallen Adam. But I created you for better things than to lie in the dirt and the dust of your sin. And to lie in a state of deadness in your sin and defilement in your sin. I created you in the beginning in Adam, breathed into you, Adam and you the breath of life. And in Adam, you became a living soul. You have the ability and the capacity to worship and to commune and to fellowship and be in a relationship intimately, eternally and savingly with your maker God. That's what distinguishes you from animal life. There's many a person could snuff out animal life like that. They could kill a fly or a spider or a rat and wouldn't think that about it. But 
God places tremendous value on human life. I'll tell you how much. Not only in creation, but in salvation. Christ sent the darling of his bosom, his only begotten and well-beloved son, into this world such was the value of life. In order to save his people from their sins, such was the value of life. So precious are his people to Christ that he suffered untold agony and sorrow, that he gave his life that we might live. I want to tell you life is a voyage. Now on which road are you travelling? Life is valuable. You need to give that life to God. And through faith in Christ and his finished work and precious shed blood and substitutionary offering once for all on the cross, you need to give your heart and life to Christ and receive forgiveness and enjoy life and fellowship with your maker. But James tells us life is a vapor. Life is a vapor. It's not only a voyage and valuable, but life is a vapor. In other words, it's here for a little season. You know what a vapor is. You'll probably see it tonight. You will maybe go home tonight and the first thing you do as we do, although we're heading to Newton Ards and we may not be able to do this, but the first thing we'll do is hit the switch and the kettle will be on. And we'll see the vapor. And all of a sudden you see it and it's gone. It's just like a little steam from the kettle or from the fire of the pot. Just a little smoke arising from a stick that's burning. Life is a vapor. It's soon finished. It's soon over. Why do you waste your life? Why do you throw precious life away? Why do you remain on the broad road in your journey to eternity? I want to tell you, my friend, life is a vapor. It's a few days and full of trouble. Job says, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Have you ever seen a loom working? A loom and the shuttle on the loom, it flies. You can't even catch it with a human eye. It's no sooner left one place and gone to the other, but it's back. You couldn't follow it with a human eye. Such is the speed of the weaver's shuttle. And Job says, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. How soon life will be over? What age are you? As a missionary came to our prayer meeting in Lisburn, it was Norman McCready. Norman McCready says, I can work my hands. I might be able to preach and do all what min- 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 preachers do, but I will uh, do with my hands what many can't do. I will work. And he came with a tape measure one day, and he pulled it out. I've never forgotten, and I've told you before. And he pulled the tape measure out, and he stopped it at 70. Would that be 70 centimeters or whatever it is on it? I'm not sure. It probably is. You builders and joiners would know. Probably 70. I'm looking at James here for a minute, for a bit of nod of the head. And he said, 70. And he says, I want you to stand up, those of you who are under 20 years of age. And they stood up and he put his finger and he says, now have a look. That's what you've left. Just the 50 years. And everybody was going along the tape measure and I was away up the tape measure. And he says, I want you to stand up. Who's under 30? And then he put his finger on the 30 and he kept it at the 70 and you could see it was only a little bit left. He says, who's under 40? And you could see that half of the tape measure was gone. And he says, who's under 50? And then he says, who's over 70? You see, friends, listen to me. What age are you? What age are you? Do you know that whenever you reach 35 years of age, According to the Bible, half your life is gone. How long have I to live? How long have you to live? Is there an answer to that question? Of course there is. Is there an answer from the Bible? Of course there is. How do you know how long a person has to live? The Bible tells me. The Bible tells me. You know what it says? As far as your body is concerned, not long. As far as your soul is concerned, forever. How long have I to live? As far as your body is concerned, not long. As far as your soul is concerned, forever. You ever thought about your soul? Because the final thought, and I'll use it as a conclusion, is life can be a victory. In other words, life doesn't have to be a vexation. It doesn't have to be one big vacation. Life doesn't have to be a void. Life in its voyage Life in its valuable or its value, and life 
Life itself can be a victory for you if you will come to Christ, if you will repent of your sin. He will give you eternal life. That's life with a capital L. That's life with quantity and quality. That's life, as Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, abundant life, life to the full. If you'll only come, if you'll only seek the Lord, if you'll only turn to him tonight, young person, older person, what is your life? Outside of Christ, nothing. In Christ, everything. Will you give him your heart tonight? Will you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you turn from your sin? Will you believe? For life is best is very brief. Like the falling of a leaf, like the binding of a sheaf. Be in time. The voice of Jesus calls you now. Be in time. Come sinner. Repent. Believe. Get right with God. And you can do so. Because God values life. He sent his son to die. He's risen from the dead. And he's here tonight. And he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Come, there's life abundant in Christ. Father, do bless the word beyond the reach of the enemy. Back at home, burn it in tonight and bury it deep in the heart of the sinner. And grant, Lord, that you'll bless it in such a way that it'll bring precious souls by the power of the Holy Ghost to the Lord Jesus Christ, the soul giver of eternal life. Part is in thy fear, and with thy favour be with our young people and those who travel over to Newton Arge. And grant, Lord, that you will continue to bless our fellowship through this night in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mm-hmm.